So next up is our presentation from Dr. Mark Harness, the director of the University of Washington Center for Technology and Disability Studies. He is also the principal investigator of the Nidler-funded ADA Knowledge Translation Center and the Nidler-funded Translating Evidence About Traumatic Brain Injury to Practice within the Washington State Department of Corrections. His presentation, Supporting Sustainable Change in Large Complex Organizations, will discuss an organizational change process that focuses on incarcerated individuals with traumatic brain injury. Just as a reminder, if you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them in the chat box. And then after the presentation, Kathleen Murphy will be leading us in an interactive discussion with the reactors and our conference participants. So Mark, are you ready to begin? I am, thank you. Thank you. So um, good morning, everybody. It is, it is still morning here in Seattle. <clears throat> and thank you to all of, all, of, all of you who've lasted through to this uh, last day of the conference. I'm going to be talking about supporting sustainable change in large, complex organizations. And much of what I have to say is in reference to an applied knowledge translation project that was funded through the University of Washington. And although I'm the presenter today, this really represents the work of a number of other people at UW, including my colleagues, Sherry Brown, Eva DeLeon, Kirk Johnson, and Becky Matter, who couldn't be here today. I also want to note that this is a project that was funded through ACL and Nidler. And I particularly, particularly want to acknowledge the unique funding mechanism. It, it is a small five-year grant that uniquely focuses on knowledge translation activities and particularly on, on topics that were originally funded by Nidler. So it allowed for the development of a project that's not just research or technical assistance, but it's something that's more fluidly focused on integration of evidence into practice with an emphasis on organizational change. And so having access to that funding um, to, or to funding that really directly supported knowledge translation has been an important part of our work. And I just wanted to note that. And I'll tell you more about how that has helped us later in the presentation. So for the first part of this presentation, I want to provide an overview of concepts related to sustainable organizational change. And then I'll address those concepts in relationship to our project. And to start, it's useful to define sustainable change. I think all of us who work in the field of knowledge translation are interested in sustainable change, although we might use different words. We might talk about implementation or uptake. Our goal is that something becomes different from the current state. And implicit in this is that the change is evidence-based and it improves outcomes in whatever area we are working. Um, change by itself can be difficult to encourage, but I, I think that changing, getting something to change, is relatively easy compared to sustaining that change over time. So it can be relatively easy to bring about short-term change or implementation. It seems significantly more difficult to keep that change going. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Organizations are dynamic places. The leadership changes, people leave, new ones come. The systems themselves create unintended pressure to do something different than what might be best practice and, and so on. So creating change that is encouraging change, training and supporting people to make change is really only the first step towards successful implementation, uh, long-term implementation of an evidence-based practice. So the sustainable part of change is hard, but I also want to talk about the, organizi uh, excuse me, the organizational side of change, which has its own complexities. So there are several factors that increase the difficulty of organizational change, and I'm going to talk about each of these. But one of those factors is the unit of change. That is, who or what is the target of the change message? At what level do we expect to see change implemented? And you could argue that change always happens at the level of the individual, I guess. And to some extent, that's true. 
But sustainable change often requires something to happen at higher levels, at group levels or system levels. And change at the individual level can itself be difficult, but I, I'd argue it's often clearer what needs to happen to encourage an individual to change, whereas change at the group or systems levels add complexity. These systems can be very opaque. The motivations that drive certain kinds of policies and organizational behaviors can be harder to determine. And so I think broad systemic change can be quite difficult to achieve and often takes longer and requires more sustained effort. Oops. There are many types of organizational change, and, and I think it's useful to think, think through some of these different, different types of organizational change. Um, and it can be useful in particular to understand how you and your team, if you're part of a team, are thinking about the change process and about your desired outcome. So for example, sometimes what we're after is evolutionary change. We're after slow incremental change that seeks to improve the existing system. And another way to say that might be that we seek continuity. So for some reason I have two boxes, one in the left, one in the right, that kind of say the same thing in different ways. So ev evolutionary change or maintaining continuity are I think similar ways of saying the same things. Other times though, we want to tear an organization apart and start over. Um, so we, we sometimes seek revolutionary change or what we might call creative destruction. So doing this means that we pull something apart to recreate it into something better. And, and these approaches necessarily have really different strategies. And I've found in my own teams that it's pretty important to have a clear talk about the kind of change that we're seeking. Um, because if part of your team wants to tear an organization apart and start over and the other part wants to fix what we already have, it, it results in conflict within the team and some mixed messages from the team. So thinking about the type of change can be quite useful. Um, as we just discussed, change can happen at different levels, local versus systemic. But it can also be focused on different parts of the organization. So in other words, it can be focused on changing an organization's strategy, kind of the high-level vision, mission, or direction of an organization. Or it can be focused on operations, really changing the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of how work gets done. Uh, obviously, those two are not exclusive. Um, there might often be a mix of the two. And uh, just again from my experience, strategic change may often need to precede operational change. And then finally, it's worth thinking about how you believe change happens. Some people think about change really as a linear process. Uh, it moves kind of in a constant stepwise path towards improvement. We're always kind of slowly getting better and better. Others think about it as a chaotic process. You know, two steps forward, one step back. Um, there are unexpected barriers that threaten to derail the entire process. There are changes in political will and leadership. We can have loss of key personnel. And um, my experience has been that most change process, if you view it at a very high level, can look somewhat linear, but that at the ground level, it al almost always feels very chaotic, um, not as controlled as you would hope it would. And obviously, the more chaos in, an, in a system, the more challenging the change process. But also, chaos should be expected and it should be planned for because it, it is going to happen. Something is going to happen that will derail a project. And you have to be prepared and have the resilience to manage it and to move forward. I want to address three components of the change process that, um, that we consider when implementing a project. And I'll talk about how these were um, applied in the project that we have. One component is leadership just understanding who has influence and power and vision to bring changes about. The second is content. What needs to change? And in KT models, this is often about the evidence-based practices, um, but it also needs to be within the context of understanding the system itself. What is the purpose, the mission, the strategy, the values in the system? And then what is it that needs to be targeted and changed? And finally, um, process, the how. How are we going to plan, initiate, implement, and sustain the change? In my work, we've had an easier time thinking about the what, the content, 
and the how, the process, um, then we have in dealing with the, the who. The who is often fairly clear at the level of the target audience, but we, we've had to really learn to understand how um, leadership and larger organizational politics play out in both the implementation and the sustainability of change. I'll end this sort of um, intro section by talking about um, types of organization because organizational change can be made more or less challenging based on the type of organization in which you're trying to work. And so clearly size matters. Trying to move a large ship is harder. Trying to turn a large ship is harder than trying to turn a smaller boat. So um, you just have more, more points of points of contact, more moving parts within the system. But management also matters. Um, in our project that I'm going to describe, this was, a, was an important thing for us to understand. Hierarchical uh, management structures can be um, in some ways easier and in other ways harder. Um, they are more structured. There are more limited pathways through which decisions can be made. Um, which can be a challenge, but they're also clearer um, in terms of where you have to start and uh, in, terms to, in terms of beginning a process. Flat structures, flat management structures can have a lot more opportunity, can be a lot more flexible uh, and open, but it can be fuzzier to understand who actually makes decisions and to uh, understand who is going to kind of keep a process moving um, as we, um, once it's implemented. Complexity matters, um, multifaceted missions versus focused missions of an organization can um, certainly uh, uh, support or impede change processes. Ownership matters, public, um, public organizations, governmental organizations may have lots of um, owners, if you will, um, whereas private uh, companies may have um, a more focused uh, uh, connection to leadership and a more limited ownership. And then that relates, of course, to stakeholders. Having a unified set of stakeholders who are all kind of pulling in the same direction is different than having a very diverse group of stakeholders who might be pulling in different directions. All of that played out in the project that I'm going to talk about. Before I do, though, I want to acknowledge something that might seem obvious to you but wasn't always to me. And that is the overlap between knowledge translation and organizational change. And I've, I've put two definitions in this slide. Um, the definition of organizational change is that it's a process in which a large company or organization changes its working methods or aims, for example, in order to develop and deal with new situations or markets. And knowledge translation, as defined by the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, is a dynamic and iterative process that includes synthesis, dissemination, exchange, and ethically sound application of knowledge to improve something. And so KT is focused on an application of knowledge to improve something, to change something. Organizational change is a modification of methods or aims to address a challenge. So there's, there's obvious some, obviously some overlap there. I think it can be helpful to revisit, um, probably for many of us, the, this knowledge to action cycle from Graham and his colleagues to see how knowledge translation fits within the organizational change process. Um, and in the center of this graphic, you can see the knowledge creation pyramid. New knowledge is developed, synthesized, and operationalized in tools and products. And then these products then go into the action cycle, which wraps around the outside, where the products are adapted to local context in relationship to barriers to use. They're tailored to fit the environment. They're monitored to see if they produce the desired effect. Outcomes are evaluated and efforts are taken to sustain knowledge use. And so clearly a change process in play there. So when I think about the relationship now between the two, I, I tend to think of knowledge translation as kind of a subset of organizational change. Knowledge translation emphasizes rigorously developed evidence-based knowledge and tools, and those are then implemented through a change process. 
But as we all know, I, I would assume not all organizational change is based on evidence-based knowledge. And so lots of change happens because of other things. Um, changes to markets, changes to funding structures, to public opinion. And organizational change doesn't always happen within the context of evidence-based um, tools and products. Um, and so I just mentioned that because it, it helped me kind of think about the nature of our work within a, this broader world of organizational change. And then the final thing I'll just discuss before I present our project, <coughs> excuse me, are the mechanisms of change. We've already talked about these high-level components of change, leadership, content, and process. So on this slide, I've listed a number of change mechanisms. This is not comprehensive in terms of all the different kinds of mechanisms you could consider to support change, but these are the ones that we found useful in our project. Um, under leadership, uh, finding champions has been critical. Developing or accessing levers, um, as in something that can leverage change. Encouraging and motivating change, finding ways to do that. And then understanding politics and maneuvering around political and organizational roadblocks. In terms of content, it's been critical to understand the problem and the context that in which we want to work. And then to engage in providing information, providing content about the innovation and change to stakeholders. <clears throat> and, and in terms of process, we focused on structuring for sustainability, mentoring and supporting um, leadership within the project. So now let me tell you <clears throat> a little bit about our project. We, as I noted, have a Nidler grant. Excuse me while I... I'm going to lose my voice. Um, a Nidler grant um, that uh, supports work uh, in the Department of Corrections here in Washington State. And the focus of our work is to help the Department of Translations understand best practice, best evidence-based practice on traumatic brain injury. And before I go much further with that, I want to talk about the type of organization that, that the Department of Corrections is. And I went through um, this list of variables in terms of organization, so I want to do that for the DOC. The DOC, first of all, is a large organization. Um, they have about 8,500 employees. There are um, around 19,000 incarcerated individuals. Uh, with another 36,000 individuals who are under community supervision. They have an annual budget of about $1.8 billion. And so this is a substantial organization. They're spread throughout the state. They have, I um, can't remember, over 20 facilities. Um, and so it, it's, a, it's a large organization. Management in the Department of Corrections is very hierarchical, very top-down. Um, this was a, a bit of a hard lesson for us, um, but thankfully we had some people who helped us understand that nothing happens in the DOC without high-level leadership approval and buy-in. And so, um, as I noted before, that makes it simpler in one sense because we know where we have to go to get approval, harder in another sense because um, if we don't get that approval, nothing, nothing, we won't be able to, to move forward. The DOC has a, a multifaceted, multifaceted mission. Um, they have a broad focus on community safety. I would say that's the core of their mission. But there is an underlying mission um, to provide rehabilitation and to reduce recidivism. Those kind of fit under the community safety mission, but, but there are complex kind of multifaceted aspects of the mission. They obviously are publicly owned and, are, and must be responsive to public need. Um, they are connected to representative leadership in, um, in the House and Senate. They, they have um, a complex ownership. And they also have diverse stakeholders. So they respond to legislators. They respond to the general public, to family members of incarcerated individuals, to mental health experts, correctional officers, and so on. And so. Um, when you look at the DOC, I think it, it hits a lot of targets for um, being a challenging site for sustainable organizational change. 
So now I'm going to walk through those three components and the mechanisms of change and talk about how they played out within the context of our project, which was really initially focused on how can we help frontline staff in the Department of Corrections to understand how traumatic brain injury affects individuals who are incarcerated and perhaps change practice to um, improve outcomes for incarcerated individuals with TBI. So I noted that one of the mechanisms related to leadership that was important for us was finding champions. And we had champions both internally and externally. Um, internally, uh, probably our, our key champion was the DOC, um, uh, Department of Corrections, Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator, compliance coordinator, um, but also a lot of support from the training and development director. These internal champions were critical for helping us to find our way through the system. They were, they were able to um, be the voice of the project internally when we couldn't be there. Um, they were able to tell us when we were about to make a mistake. Um, like, for example, um, if we were not talking to the right, um, the right person who had the, the kind of power to make that the kind of decision we were seeking. Um, they guided us through a series of barriers and challenges. They really helped us understand organizational climate and expected practices. And so without those internal champions, um, a system like uh, an organization like the DOC can seem very opaque on the outside. We, can, we would have had a very hard time understanding how to proceed. But I would say our external champions have been, have been as important because the DOC is... Uh, as a public organization is responsive to external pressure. They're very sensitive um, to um, kind of political will and how they're, um, they're viewed publicly. And so we worked with um, a number of, of groups. We have um, a, a TBI council here in Washington state that, um, that is connected to government but also um, provides kind of a stakeholder voice uh, Disability Rights Washington is our Washington State Protection and Advocacy Organization, and they have been very engaged around um, the rights of people with disability who are in, disabilities who are incarcerated, and so they've been a part of our advisory team. And then we've been able to pull in community members with traumatic brain injury, um, some of whom have had experience in correctional facilities, um, um, mostly as... Um, Correctional officers. It's been harder for us to connect to people who were prior, uh, previously incarcerated, but um, we continue to work to bring those voices in and to have the stakeholder voices that Thomas talked about. I mentioned that it's also been important for us to develop or access levers for change. Um, this this idea of leverage, I think, is has been pretty critical. Thinking about where do we actually, as an external project, have any kind of, of, of power or way of, of um, motivating change? Because, um, because we don't have a lot. And we found that a couple of things really helped us to drive change. One is that we wrote this grant proposal with the Department of Corrections. And when we did that, we received a letter of support from the, the, the DOC superintendent. And so what has happened multiple times, we're now in our third year of the project, and what's happened multiple times is that we've had to use those, those tools, the fact that we have money in a grant and that we have approval, written approval from a leadership <laughs> to, to leverage um, change within the organization. So um, DOC is a highly um, fluid kind of work environment. People are constantly coming and going especially in leadership roles. Um, people sometimes get fired, sometimes choose to leave. Uh, we, for example, have been, uh, I think we're now in our third um, superintendent within the last three to four years. Um, our training and development director, we're on our second one. Our ADA coordinator, we're on our second one. So having these kind of these leverage points in place has helped the project to continue over time. And if those hadn't been there, um, there were a couple points where we might have been kind of uh, kicked out 
basically. Um, so thinking about just how do you leverage change um, from your position, I think is an important thing to consider. In addition to having these levers, it's important to think about how you encourage and motivate um, because, because you can't, uh, one is, is more about building somebody's internal sense to change and the other is having, having kind of external motivation. And, and that internal motivation in the long run is what's really important. So um, we worked on creating a sense of urgency around the problem um, and then also on providing a vision for the future. And because we're a knowledge translation project, a big part of our approach has been to use evidence to create a sense of urgency. So I'll just give you a few examples of some of the evidence that we've, we've used. Um, this is an example from a slide that was in one of our courses. Um, and there's a, the evidence about traumatic brain injury in correctional settings is definitely in development. Um, the, the prevalence estimates are quite broad. Um, but the, the general consensus is that outside of, of prisons, outside of correctional settings, about 8.5% of Americans reported TBI, and that inside of prisons, it's, it's around 46% of people who've experienced a TBI. That's, that's the, the average of multiple studies um, that were reported in a, a paper by Durand uh, and his colleagues in 2017. And we connect that to the specific context of the Depart Department of Corrections by noting that if you apply that 8.5% to the DOC staff, assuming um, that they represent the general population, you have about 730 individuals who have experienced a TBI out of approximately 8,500 staff members. But if you look at at um, the incarcerated individuals, and you'll see the word offenders there, which was the word that was in place when we started the project. Um, as many as 46% of those individuals, or 16,859, have, uh, have experienced a TBI. And that's based on about 19,000 um, individuals in confine confinement and another uh, 18,000 plus in, in active supervision. And so, trying to find ways to help people understand the nature of the problem and to, to feel the immediacy and the need for change, I think is an important part of, of, of the leadership that goes into a change process. I mentioned that we also um, focused on, on trying to help our um, partners um, develop a vision for the future. And we, we did that by thinking about um, what the mission of the DOC was, um, and, and to help them understand how would it help them to achieve their mission if they could address the challenges faced by um, incarcerated people with TBI. And how would things be different if TBI were addressed in correctional settings, um, both for staff, for leadership, and for the community. And one thing to note about DOC is their mission and vision is in, in incredibly consistent. Their mission is to improve public safety, and their vision is working together for safe communities. So safety is really what DOC is about. And so we were trying to understand what would it, what, what would it mean to them, what would it mean to the organization, if they, and what would it mean to their mission about improving public safety if they addressed issues related to um, people with traumatic brain injury. Um, and what we found is that in order for us to enter DOC and, and to encourage this kind of organizational change, we, would, we really needed to understand the motivations of correctional staff members. So um, we needed to understand what they would gain from learning about people with TBI. Did they, did they think it would improve staff safety? Could it reduce staff frustration? Um, would the workplace be less stressful? Um, and then how should we best communicate that? What terms and approaches would be palatable and believable to that group? And I'll just note that you know, in our project, our personal and professional goals are, are bigger than really just trying to um, increase safety or uh, staff safety or reduce staff frustration. You know, we want people with TBI to receive services they need. We want them to have improved outcomes, but this pro project is focused on driving change in the DOC. And to do that, 
we need to communicate to the people in the DOC who will implement the change. We have to help them un uh, develop a motivation um, for themselves that makes sense to them within their context. And so we've tried to shift perspective and take the perspective of the individuals who we're working with. So that's about encouraging and motivating change. And then another part of leadership that we've had, we've experienced and worked on is, is really um, about politics and maneuvering. It sounds very, um, I don't know, it sounds, uh, politics are not very popular, I think, um, in general. It sounds like a, a manipulation, for example, but it's not so much about that as it is about understanding power relationships. And, and understanding in an organization how decisions flow through the organization. Um, in DOC, they flow from top down, um, more or less. But once, once they reach ground level, then they kind of flow out through networks of people who have similar or shared experiences. And so, so understanding um, kind of how, how those decisions flow and how, how they uh, gain uptake can be pretty critical. In terms of thinking about leadership, part of what we needed to do was to, to, to try to understand what it would take for leaders to feel safe moving forward with an innovation. In our case, this is quite intimidating to DOC leadership because um, we're talking about a large group of individuals who purportedly have had um, a traumatic brain injury. And the question always is, what does that mean for the DOC? What does the DOC need to do in response to that? And if the DOC needs to do something, um, is there money to do that? Are there resources to do that? What, what will be the implications for the system um, if we um, really highlight and bring forward this, this issue and begin to address it? And so um, kind of understanding motivations of leaders um, to engage or to disengage uh, is a part of this um, maneuvering through the system. And then finally, just understanding the, what kind of political failures will derail the innovation or change. You know, um, if, if, we, if we fail to talk to the right people, if we move forward too fast and create kind of a backlash, one of the things that we learned um, and, and, and a challenge we avoided is that we needed to, once we had high-level leadership, we needed to move down to um, the leadership of facility um, that, that happens at the facility level um, because facilities have, um, they're not independent, but they have a lot of independence. And so we, <clears throat> we had a meeting with all of the superintendents of all the facilities to make sure that they were on board. It would have been a political uh, failure if we had, had bypassed them um, because we would have not been able to move forward. And then uh, just another part, I think I've sort of mentioned this, is, is really about finding your way through roadblocks. What activities have to come first in order to have an open door later? And, and then pretty critically, and we're in this point right now, is what kinds of signals or messages have to be conveyed from leadership before people feel empowered to act? And what we've been told a lot is that um, people at ground level, correctional officers and so on, are not going to feel empowered to act unless they really have a clear message from leadership. And so we're currently working on, on helping leadership to feel safe and helping them to, to kind of craft the message that they're comfortable with providing to their staff members. So that's leadership. And I'll move on now to talk about content. Um, content is, as I noted, something that we probably, as, as knowledge translation, um, specialists feel more comfortable with. Um, I think there are two parts to um, content. Um, one is understanding the context in which we're working. The other is understanding the problem. Uh, I won't spend a lot of time on these because I think these are, these are kind of standard practices. Um, for our project, we spent a lot of time trying to understand the context because we were not correctional experts. Um, and this was a, the, a kind of a new um, a new task for us. So we spent a lot of time meeting with DOC leadership. Um, we had meetings with training and development unit. We took a number of visits to DOC facilities. We engaged in our own process reflections. We gathered um, materials 
and reviewed those, and we participated in Department of Corrections trainings. All of this was a needs analysis um, for us to, to really understand the system in which we wanted to work. And what we found is that, not surprisingly, the DOC is huge, it's complex, the approaches to knowledge translation were not going to be unidimensional. Um, that perspectives varied widely across staff in terms of what their jobs were, um, depending on whether they, were, the, whether they were in health services or corrections, et cetera, but that they all did really support that mission and vision of safety. Um, and we found that there was limited knowledge about TBI among the staff. Um, and so we realized that these KT interventions will need to fit within this context. Um, and we also found that there is a significant amount of training already going on, so any training that we wanted to do would need to fit within the kind of high training demands that people were experiencing. And then in terms of understanding the problem, um, we um, engaged in a scoping review, primarily looking at Nidler products on TBI. We uh, conducted a literature review of research publications on TBI and correctional settings, and we did a number of interviews with TBI experts. Um, and our findings broadly um, were that um, incarcerated people with CBI are, are likely experiencing longer sentences in more restrictive settings because of the nature of their disability. Um, and I've talked about this in, in other talks, but in general, um, you know, issues related to memory, um, emotional control, um, and those kinds of things result in the potential for increased infractions. Increased refractions um, mean that you potentially end up in more restrictive settings um, and that you don't earn time off of your sentence. And so this is not uh, a research-based finding, but this is the kind of sense of what we understood as we talked to people in, within the system. <clears throat> We also learned that correctional organizations uh, are not particularly prepared to address challenges faced by people with TBI. Um, and so um, th this, this lack of preparation causes a burden for DOC staff and the larger justice system. But we also learned about interventions that in could improve outcomes for incarcerated people with TBI and DOC staff. And so we um, are able to um, begin looking at the evidence and providing um, opportunities for change within the system. We also, um, in the, other, the, other, the other piece of content is really about educating the people who are going to be involved in the change. So I'll just let you know that we, we did spend quite a bit of time on education. We were able to develop an introductory level training, an online course that was administered to all of the staff. Uh, as part of a required in-service, and out of 8,500 staff, about 7,800 completed it. It was it was a web-based um, uh, course that included text and quizzes, infographics, and videos, and took about 45 minutes to complete. So that's been a great kind of first step in trying to increase awareness about TBI across the entire DOC. And so now as we move forward um, to begin trying to implement changes to practice, we know that the majority of people at least have a gen general understanding of traumatic brain injury and how it affects people who are incarcerated. Uh, there's an uh, image of the course objectives. We looked at prevalence, uh, understanding TBI, how um, TBI affects uh, incarcerated individuals and staff in correctional settings, and then some universal strategies that might improve interactions. Uh, I'll just mention that we also have done an intermediate level training where we've trained all of the ADA coordinators, all the facility level ADA coordinators to help them understand what is TBI and, and what kinds of accommodations might be appropriate for people with TBI. And then I want to end by talking about process. Um, process is, um, is, is about you know, the, the way in which you, so I've gone too far, sorry the way in which you um, kind of how you integrate and how you do your work within the system. And what we've focused on is um, really thinking about creating some structure. I'm a, a strong believer that sustainability is really built through changes to organizational structure. Things need to change in a way that allows um, something to sustain after a project ends, and that often means changes to organizational structure. So um, 
that means tapping into existing systems and structure and, and putting in place structures that will last. And we've done that um, primarily by working through systems that are already in place within the DOC. So the DOC has a performance management process. They actually have a team of people who support um, performance management who um, took a group of us through a process that involved initial brainstorming, development of a charter for a TBI task force. That task force then engaged in strategic planning and is in the process right now of prioritizing um, the kinds of changes that will be supported over time. And I see I didn't switch the slide for you, so this is the slide that I was referencing. Out of that process, we've developed this TBI task force. And the task force is a structure that's understandable to the DOC. The DOC has used task force structures before. It's a structure that will last after our project ends. Um, it has membership from across DOC, health services, ADA compliance, mission housing, correctional officers, and the list goes on. And it is intended to develop a shared understanding about the challenges of TBI within DOC, to develop a plan for addressing the challenges, and then as part of our project to implement a pilot study to test some of our recommendations. The last part of process that I'll talk about is <clears throat> mentoring and supporting. And um, what we have found is that it's critical for us to work with stakeholders in an organization in a way that doesn't um, result in reliance on us, um, but builds them into leadership roles so that <clears throat> as we move through the project, we are, are scaffolding our support. So maybe starting with more support in the beginning and slowly releasing our leadership, releasing our um, control, and encouraging the development of leadership and stakeholders within the organization. Um, that's happened in a number of ways through the task force. The task force has a, a number of committees. We have committee chairs. Those chairs are being supported um, to become really vision leaders within the organization around um, the issues facing people um, with, uh, who are incarcerated and who have traumatic brain injury. And so we've worked to support them in those roles until they develop the necessary skills and the confidence for success. So I'll, I'll wrap up now and just say um, a, a few conclusionary comments. Um, one is that knowledge translation approaches, I think, are a very important part of organi organizational change interventions. Um, and thinking about the relationship between organizational change models and knowledge translation is pretty important. It's been helpful for us as we've, we've tried to maneuver the system. Um, but that organizational change is much more complicated than just sort of evidence to practice. I think we all know um, over many years that just having good evidence, um, just knowing about better practice doesn't result in change. And that change really requires careful attention to structures, to power, to access, to supporting and building leadership, and the list goes on. Um, it also requires, organizational also change also requires um, uh, I didn't move you through to my conclusions. There you go. Organizational change also requires attention to external changes that can influence internal organizational changes. These organizations don't exist in a vacuum. And so um, we've definitely found that um, external pressure can um, be an important part of driving internal change. And the last thing I'll say is, is maybe not super helpful, but we found in this project that, that sometimes uh, it's really just a lot of luck and good timing. Um, you're, you're, I'm often surprised about how smoothly some things go and how difficult other things go. Um, and, and a lot of it really is just right place, right time, right people. But I've also found that, that being prepared to take advantage of those opportunities goes a long way. Being ready to jump, um, having the resilience to wait, to keep pushing and so forth can really be important in terms of how, how you can help to um, encourage change within an organization. And so um, I'll end with that. Uh, we do have some contact information if in the um, PowerPoint, a few references. Uh, and I'll turn it back over, I think, to, is it Kathleen? This is Stephen. I'm happy to take over for just Stephen. a second. Um, 
And thank you very much, Mark, for your presentation. Um, and now we will turn over to Kathleen for the interactive discussion. Thanks. Hi, everyone. This is Kathleen. Um, thanks, Mark. This is a really helpful presentation, both, you know, very rich in that you described a lot of KT theory, but also obvious really great example of an actual KT project and all of its complexities. Um, if you, everyone, remember, that I, we do have a question from Rasmin Esmail about slide six, um, which I'll just describe so you don't have to scroll back. It's the one on types of organizational change, and then you had five boxes, evolutionary versus revolutionary change, local versus systemic change, continuity versus creative destruction, linear or chaotic process, and strategic versus operational. Um, where do you think evaluation would fit in on slide six? Would it be on one of those boxes? Um, is it a type of organizational change, a phase? I think, um, I don't know if I would define it as a type of organizational change. Um, I think it probably fits better within when we're looking at slide 10 and that knowledge to action cycle, it's a part of understanding what has happened in, um, as a result of the efforts that have been implemented. And those efforts could be um, change um, processes that were evolutionary or revolutionary, um, you know, uh, strategic or operational, um, but that evaluation would really be about understanding um, the outcomes of Implement, implementing that change process. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, this was another question that came up also relatively early in the presentation when you were defining terms back on slide nine. You were comparing organizational change with knowledge translation. And um, Joanne Mosel is curious as to the reason for using the Canadian Institutes for Health Research definition of knowledge translation. He mentions that she's on a CIHR SPOR network. Um, Given all the definitions of KT that are out there, why that one? I don't know. It's one I'm familiar with. It's one that I, I, that makes sense to me. Um, I, uh, no particular reason. Um, it also links up, I think, um, pretty well with the KTA cycle. Um, but do you have recommendations for better definitions or um, have a concern about the use of this definition? Uh, so Joanne, we welcome you to um, respond there in the chat. I will chime in um, as the PI of the Center on KTDRR who's tracked knowledge translation for a mm -hmm. long time and worked closely with our um, project officer at UU, Mark Simjai Sudsawad, who's mm -hmm. here with us. Um, Nidler has um, explicitly looked to CIHR for inspiration about KT and modified it for its own purposes. But mm -hmm. um, Joanne, that's not an accident. Uh, Nidler is very aware of CIHR and all the contributions it has made to KT. So turning to um, Nasreen Jasani, he says, I love the idea of champions to help with navigating a system. In a research environment, would you consider the technical advisory group, AG, or project advisory boards or committees, sometimes called PACs, playing a similar, similar role? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. And, and that's, in fact, how we've used what we call our advisory team. Our advisory team is made up of both internal champions and external champions. So people who are inside the DOC and people who are um, in uh, Disability Rights Washington and the, T, uh, the TBI, statewide TBI Council. Um, what I've found is it's, it's been quite useful to have that advisory team be mixed um, between internal and external, you know, both mostly champions, those are people who are on our side, but they've also, they, um, they've also been people who are just sort of new to the project who've sat in on those advisory teams, and it's been very helpful for them to hear how, um, for example, the Disability Rights Washington lawyers frame the problem um, and, uh, and the, the significant 
significant concerns they have. Um, I think there's been a, it's been a way of kind of, and, and then on the flip side, it's been very useful for uh, our external community members to hear the the real world constraints of those individuals who work inside of DOC. So there's been a nice back and forth. Uh, we've been lucky. I know we haven't had kind of it blow into conflict, but a, a, a shared understanding about the problem space. And so I think an advisory team can can serve that function. It, it really, um, I don't know that I have rules in my head about what the right makeup is, um, but I think there is a way to, to craft it so that um, you need to have people who are both really motivated, but also really um, uh, able to um, understand the bigger picture beyond their own perspective, their own individual perspective. And um, so, yes, I think that would be a good way to approach it, a good, a good mechanism or structure to support that kind of um, development of champions. It, it also, though, I would say doesn't, you can have sort of solo champions who don't participate in those kinds of advisory meetings, and they can be pretty important as well. Um, often, uh, what I've seen is that those are people in leadership positions who aren't going to position, who are not going to participate in the day-to-day -day, um, of the project, but who are really critical to to work with and make sure that they understand that they're comfortable and and to get their um, their buy-in um, as they move through, you know, their their work in the organization. They often kind of they they, they are able to show their support um, and that that can be pretty critical. Thanks, Mark. Um, so the next question came later in your presentation. It was, um, I think, prompted by slide 31 when you noticed that your online course that launched on July 1st, 2017 to all 8,500 Department of Corrections staff, mm -hmm. you had 7,842 of them complete the course. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get the high turnout for the web-based education in corrections? Well, see, this is this is the beauty of a hierarchical organization. Um, it's required. Um, this is their in-service. Uh, so, 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 so the way that uh, that the completion is so high is because this is a required part of in-service. I think the thing that was that was successful from our perspective is that we we were so lucky to be asked to create a course that would be part of the in-service, if that makes sense. Um, the completion rates are high because people had to do it, but, but our, our project was um, supported to be part of the um, required educational opportunities that year. Um, so I think that there's, there, um, the fact that we were able to do that really comes back to our connection to leadership. So we, were, we connected into the training and development uh, unit's um, director. Um, they were eager to, to work with us around the development of something, and they understood the mechanisms, the mechanisms that would have the greatest impact. So, you know, we could have done a training that was not um, part of the in-service. We could have done trainings that were only administered to new um, staff as they're hired. There were a bunch of different ways that we talked about it. Um, and the fact that we were able to do it as part of the required in-service is, I think, what... Um, gave us that the, the large participation. It definitely illustrates the value of um, integrated KT rather than coming at the DOC with a prepackaged course. Right. Um, so even though it was a mandate, like not everyone's a perfect employee, did you use other methods, you know, were people really into the course? Was there a lot of buy-in or were there incentives or it was really just their compliance? You know, participation was primarily about compliance, um, but we received very um, strong positive feedback about the course. And I think that is in relationship to the quality of the course. So people in DOC, um, staff in DOC, have extensive and burdensome training requirements. Um, it's, you know, it, everybody, I'm sure, in your own organizations have to take those silly um, trainings that you don't want to tra take in, in the University of Washington, I have to do asbestos training every three years, even though I will never probably touch asbestos. 
And so there's a lot of that kind of um, kind of compliance training. And we were able to do a, a training that had a lot of video where people, um, people um, we, we interviewed people who were in corrections, both health services and correctional officers about the issue of traumatic brain injury. Um, we brought in community members. Um, we have, um, we have a, a couple of individuals with TBI. So, um, so I would say that the, 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 you know, the first click was, was about compliance. I have to take this course. But that um, we were able to motivate um, people to find the issue um, important and engaging um, because we, um, we were able to bring our expertise in instructional design to the development of a course and also to bring um, resources that came from the grant to actually do the video. Video is quite a bit more expensive than just slide-based um, uh, training. So I think all those things kind of came into play. Um, the challenge now, I'll, I'll just tell you, is that that happened in 2017. The challenge has been to keep the momentum going. So everybody took that. They're all kind of aware of TBI. Um, some of them took it a little bit further and learned more. A lot of them didn't. And so now we're in, in the TBI task force trying to understand how do, we, how do we keep this interest going. And so we're working on a communications plan where we're going to start putting out um, there's a DOC newsletter, for example. So we'll put out some uh, an article there. There's a um, there's a task for uh, not a task force. There's a um, uh, this is a funny a phone call just came for me and interrupted my line of thought too. Um, there's a there's a sometimes the superintendent um, does a video um, little uh, note, and so we're going to work to see if the superintendent will do something on TBI. But really broadly kind of keeping um, the issue to the forefront for this large group of people. Um, and then thinking about really more focused training, like we want to do some additional training for the ADA coordinators and so forth. So as you think about trying to um, convince people of the value of the program and the importance of its sustainability, um, do you have any evaluation data? Namrata was wondering, um, she says, excellent presentation, Mark. How is the impact of your program being evaluated within the DOC, you know, whether it be the training itself or the overall effort? Yeah. We're, we're engaging in, right now anyway, in what, what, uh, what is basically a process evaluation. It's fairly qualitative. We're collecting notes. We um, are interviewing people who have participated um, in the implementation of the work so far to understand, um, really more to understand the effectiveness of our knowledge translation approach, our, our organizational change approach. And so, um, and all of that with all of the, the, the kind of needs, of needs data that we collected uh, that I told you about earlier, all of that gets wrapped into um, trying to understand um, what's worked and what hasn't worked and how we might change things moving forward. So it's more of an engaged evaluation that's being used to help us think about the next step. One of the unique things about this project is, you know, we proposed kind of high level that we would do a needs assessment, we do some education, and then we would run a pilot. Um, but the beautiful, <laughs> I think, part of this is that we've been able to craft the specific procedural um, work within the context of what we learned from previous parts of the project. So the education really came out of our needs analysis. And now moving into, um, we're, really, we're really right now in the process of planning um, this pilot study where we're going to go into one, maybe two facilities and implement practices that, that will come out of the TBI task force. So the TBI task force right now is engaged in strategic planning and prioritization. And that prioritization is around um, an understanding of kind of what seems to be likely to be effective and, and also seems likely to be doable, um, you know, within the constraints of the organization. Um, and so, um, so, yeah, I think, uh, let me back up to the evaluation question. So there's been process evaluation, and then there will be an evaluation of a pilot study. Um, what has surprised me is that we started out the project really focused on changes, uh, helping correctional staff, frontline correctional staff, to understand traumatic brain injury. Um, and our task force has broadened that significantly so that they are interested in, um, they're also interested in how can they provide support to 
people with TBI, um, perhaps through um, support groups and some other kinds of interventions. And they're also interested in how they can potentially provide information out to um, family members as well. And so, um, so, so the task force itself has enlarged the purpose of the, of the project. Great. Um, and Maggie, I did see your um, question that you're asking if the web-based training will be available to other departments of corrections in other states. And I think we can infer from what Mark has explained so far that it's not in other states, but I'm sure he'd be happy to scale it up. Yeah. Um, I, I just, I did, um, can I quickly tell you that it's not out yet, but I, we are probably, we're trying to kind of redesign it and release it through the National Institute on Corrections. So the goal is to have it out there. Yeah. Um, so I want to remind people that we are here with some other people on the line. Jennifer Weaver is from the George Washington University, Eileen Brennan from uh, the Research and Training Center for Pathways to Positive Futures at Portland State University, and Lorraine Johnson, who um, has a number of affiliations. She's the CEO of LymeDisease.org. Um, so we wanted to think about is there a time when you may have had concerns about an organizational change that was being implemented? And we asked Lorraine to um, think about that. Thank you. I, I would say that uh, I have watched organizational change trying to be implemented in large organizations, such as the Cochrane uh, Colloquium in terms of uh, implementing patient engagement. And I've watched it in newer organizations such as PCORI. And I think that when you're dealing with organizational change within a, a, a large system that has been around for a while, it's very hard to get change because you have legacy systems. People have an institutional memory of how things are done. Uh, but if you have a new organization that's starting with a blank sheet of paper, the sky's the limit, and you're creating all the rules, and you have the funding to go along with it. So change is much more easily uh, implemented and motivated. I think that a lot of times when you're dealing with a larger organization, one effective strategy may be to have a funding source that is from an organization that is smaller and nimble and that sets the rules for engagement in a way that can be meaningful. So change is just very difficult generally, but incentives particularly if you can align funding incentives towards the change, then you've got a little bit of a heads up. And, uh, and I just wanted to mention one other factor that I think is important in terms of sustainability of change. And, uh, you know, Cochrane had tried to institute and get patients engaged for over 20 years and really just made very little progress there. And the, the problem, part of the problem, I think, was that the sense of urgency went away after the first study was published. And so the concept of in implementing, uh, you know, check-ins, annual check-ins, how are we doing? Let's reassess. Let's have measurements that we determine what our success is. What does the success look like in terms of, you know, the Department of Corrections? How is this helpful to them? I think that might be a helpful approach. That's a really good point. Thanks. Um, so the, Mark did bring up the issue of timing in the sense that sometimes you have lucky timing. Um, so Jennifer, we ask you to think about organizations all deal with a unique set of challenges and situations. However, from your perspective and within your organization, how important is timing? Could it be more yeah, effective thanks for to implement change as soon as possible, or is it always better to take time to plan, research, and implement carefully? This is Jen Weaver. Um, I smiled, Mark, when you said um, the comment about being in the right place at the right time. And I do think timing is critical. Um, and I think there are so many factors that can affect our timing, whether it's external and something that is more politically related or if it's contextual and based at the organization or even individual. Um, all of these factors can influence our timing and the potential for success that we're going to have. Um, one way that I like to think about it is I like to think about it as the climate for implementation. And I think sometimes in regards to the question of could it be more effective to implement change as soon as possible, 
Um, it really depends on that implementation climate. And if you have the skills in place and the absence of obstacles, whereas there might be other times when you're going to take the time to plan, research, and implement things more carefully. Um, I think even um, what was mentioned earlier about having a source of funding, and yet even that can come to timing, right? Is what you want to study and what your project is, is there a mechanism of funding available in that moment? Or do you have to wait and kind of get a little bit more creative? Um, but I definitely think timing can be critical to change. Thanks, Jen. Um, and of course, the theme of today, we've had a week where we, you know, started with the beginning on Monday and then looking at implementation on Wednesday. And today we're trying to focus as much as we can on implementation, I mean, on um, measurement. So, um, Eileen, we'd ask you to think about it from a researcher perspective. How would you go about measuring the amount or effectiveness of the changes you were hoping to make? Well, I think one thing that's really important is getting stakeholders to uh, buy into and maybe suggest some of the measurements. Um, and that's something that we've done in trying to get youth voice represented at agency levels and making change happen at organizations um, that serve young people with mental health problems. And um, actually putting together scales where everybody knows what's going to be measured. Um, we had a recent uh, project uh, that looked at youth involvement and youth, youth voice, and we had key themes such as taking a collaborative approach or having empowered youth representatives and measure those and watch to see what happens over time as systems evolve and develop. Well, that's, uh, again, the importance of stakeholders and a um, good way to go out. I think Stephen's going to take us to the break and let us know if there's any housekeeping.